Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending SCLA's second sponsored webinar titled Diversifying Your Collection, Engaging All Users, A Small Academic Library Moving Forward. I'm Caroline Smith, and I will be your moderator today. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, we have two presenters today. Rebecca Freeman and Katrina Davis Kendrick are both librarians from USC Lancaster. This webinar discusses how a small academic library uses traditional collection development tools and outreach and advocacy to promote campus diversity and inclusion. Attendees will come away with tips and collaboration ideas for making changes to their collection. Feel free to ask questions in the chat box while they're presenting. I will compile the questions and the presenter will address them at the end of the session. A recording of the session and presenter slides will be emailed to all registered users. The video will be uploaded to SCLA's YouTube channel. And with that, um, I will make you all the presenters so you can share your slides, um, Rebecca and Katrina. Hello everyone, I'm gonna turn on a camera just for a minute just to say hello. I'm Katrina Davis Kendrick and Rebecca Freeman is with me. We're sharing a office. <laughs> We're sharing our space today, so as we um, give folks, um, as we move back and forth, you'll probably hear something like this. So uh, bear with us um, as we um, share our space today. So I'm going to turn off my camera now. Um, so today we'll be talking about how what, what we've been doing at uh, Medford Library here at University of South Carolina Lancaster to, to diversify our collection. We're a small academic library and we'll be talking about um, how, exactly how small we are in just a few minutes. So we'll be talking about fundamentals um, of diversity and diverse collections, the need for diverse collections, and then we'll get into what we've done at our small rural academic library. And like Caroline said at the, be at the beginning, um, then we'll take questions and have discussion. So let's get started. So first, I'd I'm going to um, ask you to go ahead and be active in the chat function. I'd like for you to um, define diversity. Broadly, what does diversity mean for you? And then um, after you answer that question, think about that for a few moments. When you think about whatever diversity means to you, how does that definition that you've created manifest through your co-location and provision of resources at your library? So I'd like to, for everybody to take a few moments and be active in chat um, to consider those questions and some responses. Thank you. So one person says, having a collection that appeals to a wide variety of patrons. All right. Anyone else care to share? I'll give you about 30 more seconds. Another person says, <clears throat> having items in collection that represent the backgrounds and interests of our patrons, hashtag representation matters. Another person says, diversity to me is recognizing that not everyone is like me. So far, efforts have been concentrated in our small, very small recreational reading collection. 
All right. So um, what I'm hearing from that, Angie, um, if you're at a academic library, are you saying that you're concerned about how that might be represented in your larger general collections or your, your larger discipline-related collections? And you can say yeah, your nay or expound on that if you like. All right. All right, you guys can continue to uh, uh, answering that question. Thank you so much for your responses so far. So the Office of Diversity for the um, Library, American Library Association says that diversity defined is the sum of the ways that people are both alike and different. So we've heard that just a, few mo a mo moment ago. Visible diversity is generally those attributes or characteristics that are external but diversity goes beyond external to internal characteristics that we choose to define as invisible diversity. So those are um, characteristics and attributes that are not readily seen. So when I think about that, I think of um, ability levels, um, uh, experiences that people have that inform their beliefs and what they would want to see on the shelves. So those things as well. Librarians have a um, diversity imperative within their work, and ALA mentions that librarians should provide materials and information presenting all points of view on current and historical issues. Furthermore, that materials should not be prescribed or removed because of partisan or doctrinal approval. So that goes back to the code of ethics, um, which mentions that we uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and resist all efforts to censor library resources. So our professional organization speaks to these um, imperatives in collection development and in practice to a certain degree, too, in keeping things accessible, regardless of our um, what we personally believe we're here to offer information and make sure people have access to it. When we look at diversity in collections, um, the ALA Council um, also mentions that librarians have a professional responsibility to be inclusive in collection development, and that includes interlibrary loan services. And to offer access to all content legally obtainable should be assured to the user, and policies should not unjustly exclude content, again, even if it's offensive to the librarian or the user. This includes content that reflects a diversity of issues, whether they be political, economic, religious, social, ethnic, or sexual. Um, a balanced collection reflects a diversity of content, not an equality of numbers. So keep that in mind. So um, we shouldn't be ticking off boxes as much as making sure that all, as, as much as we can include information about content, how different issues are, um, the kaleidoscopic ways one issue can be discussed and presented to the user. Recently, I did a study with my colleagues at Louisiana State University, and one of the things we found when we're looking at diversity in collections is that when we talk with African-American students who are attending predominantly white institutions or historically white uh, colleges and institutions, um, your universities, um, African-American students who um, more, are more likely to feel welcome, and the definition of welcome is gladly received in the space. They're more likely to feel welcomed in their academic libraries. Um, when they are feeling that way, they're more likely to perceive that their information needs are being met. And this was particularly true in the business and STEM disciplines. So keep in mind that part of diversity, the outcome is that people will feel welcome in your space. And so um, this is this idea is backed up by this information that we receive from African-American students. And we're looking at other uh, students of color, other student groups as well. So keep that in mind when you're considering the impact of diversity in your collections. I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca. So. Um, when we're looking at the diverse collections, one of the things that we were thinking about was, okay, what, what's actually being published? What's actually available to add to your collection? Um, and when we were looking at tr trying to find some stats to kind of show you kind of where things are in publishing, really the only stats you're going to find are in children's books. 
Um, I'm sure there's some out there a little bit for others, but primarily you're just going to find the children's books and materials. And you'll notice there's a drastic chain of difference between books that are being published, which is that blue line, and then things that are actually written by and about people of color, First Native Nations. Um, so when we're looking at diverse collections, one of the things to remember is no matter how much you add to your collection, there's only so much that's actually being published out there by the big publishing companies and things like that. So we still have some changes that need to be made there. So I'm going to hand you back to Trina. These charts also say that show us an, um, in stark terms that um, we have a long way to go to even if, to even catch up. So um, for the pushback that we'll discuss later, there's the blue line and there's all the lines below. So it's going to take us a long time before we even get to a place where someone would perceive that that voice is that a dominant voice is being marginalized. This next few this next piece of the conversation we'll have speaks to whiteness in LIS, and I think, and we decided we want to talk to you about this or share this perspective because this is one of the things in practice of why it's difficult, we believe, to diversify collections in libraries. So right now, our profession looks like this: is 87% Caucasian, and um, that's been kind of where it's been holding, and at least since I've been a librarian. And that's been since the early millennia, millennium. Um, it's 81% women. And um, there are persistent gaps in racial and ethnic LIS recruitment, advancement, and retention. Um, actually, the numbers have gotten worse since Davidson Hall wrote their diversity counts report in 2007. Um, so either the, the, the if the needle has moved, it has moved um, backwards for all almost every um, non-dominant racial ethnic group um, coming to when, it, when we talk about recruitment in the field. But we also have to remember that desegregation of libraries and in LIS education is a near past phenomenon. Um, it's not even a lifetime that people of color were able to come into American libraries and get equitable service. And Dr. Cook, Nicole Cook, who's coming to USC this this um, fall, yay, um, has written about, um, done a historiography of uh, what happened when people, um, when, when we started recruiting for LIS education at um, her former institution in um, Urbana-Champaign. So desegregation of libraries is not that long ago, and we know that we still have concerns and um, issues with um, continuing unequitable access to spaces and resources when we read about things about students coming into libraries and being asked to leave or being, um, being uh, encountering hostile encounters in public libraries, academic libraries. So these issues continue in our American libraries. There's also this idea that um, was recently discussed, and I want to share with you too, about whiteness in and as collections. So um, whiteness, there's a idea that whiteness is um, also um, collocated or conflated with property, and that was solidified by the system of slavery. So who can own what? Um, and for a long time, only people who were Caucasian could be able to own things, and that included people in terms of slavery. And this um, Harris talks about this in her law journal, in the law journal in 1993. When we consider that, that means that when you merge whiteness and property, who can own things, that means you can now have a common foundation as to who can be excluded from certain things, right, property rights, who can, uh, spaces and places, um, things. Within the context of the library as a space, library collections generally, within when we look at how many collections are currently um, created, they promote and center the hegemony of white male viewpoints, and they are th and that white male viewpoint is deemed and tacitly disseminated as knowledge by librarians. This dissemination is channeled via collection development and reflected in overwhelmingly in physical spaces that house these overrepresented views. So they become sort of print mausoleums to a white male viewpoint that is perceived as the knowledge, the knowledge with a capital K. 
Um, these spaces are often funded by fiduciary sources, systems, and events that have historically or continue to subjugate, harm, and prison people of color and Native peoples. So consider where these fiduciary system monies come from, who, who got that money, how they got that money, and now that continues to fund these spaces, these library spaces or um, academic spaces and so on and so forth. And it sends this message that people of color, African Americans and, and First Nations or indigenous peoples, their, their voices, their, including their scholarship, are not as important and they are irrelevant. And as a result, that underscores that many library spaces remain unwelcoming and exclusionary towards um, non-dominant peoples. Um, this comes from a um, piece, a recent piece from Sophia Long. I encourage you to read it. It's called Whiteness as Collections. And I also encourage you, if you have some time, to read over Harris's um, article as well. I think it's helpful. And, and you want to reconsider and really consider that for a lot of people of color and African Americans and Native peoples, that um, sp libraries are, by default, they continue to be white spaces. Um, we'll turn now, having given you a, um, a quick framework of why we think this is so important, let's turn now to what we're doing at Lancaster. Um, Rebecca, you want to do this? Okay, I'll hand it back to Rebecca. Thank you for your patience. So to kind of give you an idea of where we're coming from, so you've already seen the, the bigger picture of where libraries are in regards to collections and things like that. Um, so at USC Lancaster, we are a small rural academic library. Um, by small, I mean Katrina and myself are the two librarians here. We are very small. Um, we are the only librarians here. Um, we are a commuter college, so that we do not have any housing on campus. Um, and we are primarily um, focused on the lower, um, like freshmen and sophomores coming in. But we do also provide support for upper um, uh, undergraduates as well. Um, they are primarily taking those classes online, but they do come into the library and we are providing resources for them and assistance. Um, like I said, we are the only two librarians here. Um, so we do handle all of the collection development that is done in house. Um, and we've had, historically, a fairly large gap in collection growth. Um, when we both came um, in 2012, we, my understanding is that we really hadn't had much in regards to collection growth in at least six years, um, if not longer. And we have recently done a lot of weeding um, to remove materials um, due to condition and content and doing some massive, you know, restructuring as exactly what we want in the collection. Um, and in doing that, we have been updating and diversifying our physical collections. So a little bit about USC Lancaster to kind of give you a context of where we're coming from. So this is... Um, the student racial ethnic demographics for last year. Um, so as you see, we are uh, primarily white, 64.2%, um, and then um, black, 14%. Um, so when we're looking at our patrons, you know, if we went by just what our primary um, patrons are, would be white, um, we wouldn't necessarily be diversifying our collection as much. So we wanted to see kind of where we are in regards to our student demographics. So like I said, we have done some weeding. Um, right now we're at about 59,000 volumes, um, which is about 20,000 down from where we started, um, which I know a lot of people are gonna like, oh my goodness, you got rid of so much stuff. Um, but it is, you know, doing that weeding is really important when you're doing your collection development. Um, we have, over the years, added multiple different collections. We are a selective federal depository, so we do get those government documents and materials. Uh, we have recently added a juvenile collection. Um, we also have been updating and adding to our AV area. Um, we've added an oversized collection. 
one of the areas that we really enjoy having is our new books because then we can highlight the things that are coming in. People come and look specifically for the new books, um, specifically our professors, so they can go and use them in their classes. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, our library of things. So when we're doing our collection development, we're not just looking at AV items. We're not just looking at books. We are also looking at things like games. We are adding puzzles. We're getting board games, things like that. So we can add those to our library of things and check those out. Um, and then, of course, we have our Lancer Scholar Square, um, which is similar to the Scholar Commons. Um, in this particular case, we're doing ephemera materials and not specifically things that are published. And then we have a really robust events and programs calendar. Um, one of the things that we've done with our collection development is really use that to help us do this, you know, find out where we're lacking in materials and really help us determine where we need to go. Um, and those programs, we do it all year long. We've started doing it during the summer, even though we don't have a whole lot of summer classes, but we're trying to really invest people in coming into the library and really, um, you know, making use of the resources. And then this planned theme resource exhibits. So we do this throughout the year. We have a specific theme at the beginning of the year. The last um, year we did um, Continental Medford. So we did collection development specifically in regards to um, materials that related to the different continents. Um, and that's another way that we've been able to really develop our collection. And then we do have, um, Trina's been awesome with our social media presence, um, and it's a way for us to kind of display what we have um, in different ways. So we have our Instagram and our Facebook, um, and we're posting a lot of materials on there, showing what the resources we have, um, and also showing students who are using them. So, Trina, you wanna talk about this? Thanks, Rebecca. So um, I'm showing, what you see in front of you right now is um, I was on a committee last year, the first generation students, uh, college students committee. And so these were questions that were formed by that committee. And what you'll see is um, this is the best way we can determine how people are using the library. Um, and what they tell us is that's great. When they come with, in classwork, they come to the library. I expect them to come. For, uh, Met for Libraries um, results are in blue or people that indicated Met for Library. So we see here that people come to us when they need help with classwork, and they come here when they need a place to study. But was um, was really great was uh, people who um, use places to socialize. They come to Medford Library even before they come to the um, the student center, and so that means they're finding things in the library um, even when they're not wanting to study they're still using the space. So I share that to share with you that people are using our spaces, which means they're engaging with the books because we have book displays here and our circulation um, has gone up. Particularly we can track for say new books and things like that. So um, I like to share these results too that um, I want, and it's going back to that idea of being welcome in a space. So when people feel welcome, they're more likely to come into your space. So collection development, you probably, guys thought you were going to just talk about books, but really collection development and diversification really is about, for us, the point of being welcome in the space so people will engage with the space, and that includes the books in the space and the people in the space and so on and so forth. So keep that in mind. I'm hoping you'll broaden if you had like this idea of collection development means we purchase materials. For us, collection development means we're doing this to a to, to create a space of welcome so they're getting resources that speak to them and also help them in their lives or whatever they're doing here on campus. So when we're looking at building collections, these are things that we have been considering in our small library, keeping in mind that there are just two of us. Um, and, Bo and Rebecca is a, was a newer librarian when she, became, when she came to us and she was kind of tasked with this. Um, is with building our collections, really taking on purchasing and acquisitions for us. So we examined our collections, which is why we did this weeding project, <laughs> okay? And um, we had to figure out what is our focus. Well, we know who our focus are, is now because we know what our demographics look like and we know what our programs are. And we had to determine a budget, which when we came here, there was none. And I mean, I'm not trying to be funny like, oh, it was like $10,000, none. I mean, it was actually 
zero for a while. Um, and then we had to figure out, okay, what formats can we support and then what resources we're going to use and who else are we going to be working with? So these are some things, again, it just wasn't about books. It was about who else are we going to be working with? We also believe in advocacy here. Um, we've been putting our hands on everything that has to do with student retention and engagement. And this has really helped us as we've been able to advocate um, and retain and gather more funds for our collections in the subsequent years that we've been here. So I mentioned the necessary weeding, and so has Rebecca. The weeding was necessary, and um, what we when we what we also realized too, though, as we would do our work and we're engaged with our patrons, is that even traditional items we did not have. So, for instance, the classic quote unquote classic works, like for instance, we didn't have a any copies of War and Peace at one point or something like that. So we had to go back and purchase even those um, classic works, keeping in mind the idea of whiteness as collections, being careful to make sure we're not just promoting, you know, the dominant voices, but we did have to go get those classic works. We also did an age of collection report, and at that time we were 30 years old. So one of the things that we inherited was um, when our library was opened, we didn't have a traditional, from what we understand, we didn't have like a they didn't, um, when you open a new library or when our library was expanded, you usually will create like an opening day collection. That didn't happen for our library. Because we're a regional library and there are politics involved, people sent, what happened was in order when we opened our, our library, people from um, other libraries in the system sent the books they didn't want anymore. So that contributed greatly to the age of our collection, which, so our collection in, um, historically has never been current. And so Rebecca and I realized very quickly that we're going to have to basically we're extremely behind the eight ball um, because our collection is just um, historically was already old when the library opened. Um, with Because we had that age of collection, uh, concomitant to that was we had a lack of diversity of experiences and viewpoints in our collections. So um, even though we're working really diligently now, uh, we're still working against a heavily Western European centric collection that has a lot of books using out of date language and promote hegemonic points of view and just a general lack of racial, political, religious and sex gender experience diversities. Um, and we, at that point, we also had one general collection. So all the books were housed in just a general collection. And so that made it hard to appropriate to uh, locate and sometimes even appropriately shelve items. So that's why you see now we have these different collections. Just last summer, we created a juvenile collection. So the juvenile, all the juvenile books are in one space and on the bottom floor. Um, we have, you know, when we talk about the oversized collections, you can't put an oversized book on a regular shelf or it ends up being on the bottom shelf laying flat and no one knows where it is. So we created an oversized collection so those um, larger items can be appropriately shelved. So sometimes building collections is just making sure people can access them and it makes sense where they are. Do we need really one general collection? That takes some work, but if it's something that can be done, consider that as a best practice. If people can't find it or things are not being appropriately shelved, perhaps you have enough items to create an oversized collection or a picture book selection, a collection or a juvenile collection or whatever those things are for you. So and so I know we do it a lot with popular reading. That usually is what people kind of go to. We have a popular reading collection, you know, um, new books. But perhaps there's some things that if you pulled it out, um, you can create it so people are more can find it more easily. It doesn't have to be called the African American or the uh, section, but just, you know, whatever you, popular fiction or whatever it is you want to do. But are there other locations, are there other books, other items um, due to size or content or something like that? Um, just like you would create a maps collection, for instance. What are some other places you can create um, cert, uh, uh, collections where people can locate them more easily? So let's talk about building collections, growing funding. So I'll tell you a story from 2012. I came in January of 2012 and Rebecca didn't join us until August 2012. And so when I came in January and I think in early May, the library director in that time, at that time said, Katrina, let's go to Columbia. Columbia is an hour away from here, um, from us. And I said, okay. And we went to Barnes and Noble in Columbia, South Carolina, and we walked around the um, the bookstore and we pulled books. 
and that was the first time that the books had that we had per that books had been purchased for that library since around 2006. Okay, so we purchased and we I can't even remember how much we spent, but I think we purchased enough for like three or four boxes, and we stacked it up in the van and we took it to Columbia for processing to the main campus, and that's the first time that we had had books, new books. And so if you come to our library now, you'll see there's like a gap where the only reason you see books between 20, 2006 and 2012 is because Rebecca and I have now been purchasing them um, as we gather things. So we had to grow our funding. Um, and that meant that we had to re-educate our campus administration because we still, Rebecca and I still don't know how it became that the library had no funding for that amount of time. But since then, we've been re-educating our campus and we've been doing that a myriad of ways through these things that we kind of talked about, programs and things like that. Um, we offer programs and um, events and we link those programs and events to advocacy in the library, which then um, promotes people in the library, which then we now have a budget. So our budget, has um, expanded a great deal, but we still continue have, having to say, you know, like this past budget year, we had to remind someone, they thought we had, a, we, we were down a certain amount of money. We were like, no, that money is encumbered and you can't just take it away because if you keep doing that because you're looking at the, the money that's not encumbered, you'll eventually get us back down to zero. So we have to teach people about how, uh, acquisition cycles run for libraries. Book, you might order a book in October, but that book may not come if it's out of print or you know, there, if it's back stock, it may not show up at your library and be resolved in that bill until even you know, maybe the next, right before the next fiscal year shows up. We have continuous funding advocacy. We're always talking about, um, we never let up. <laughs> We never let up that, you know, the library is a growing organism. And so um, we're always talking about advocacy and funding. And we do that through the identification. When the, when the, when the um, campus identifies a new degree pathway, we remind them that the library needs to be able to support that pathway with, it, with the materials in the collection. And so, no, you're gonna be, we're going to be asking for more funding. If you added a pathway, then we make sure we got to collect for that. So now we need this fund funding to make sure we have monies to, to promote, um, you know, we have computer science. So the books we bought last year, we might have to buy some more books because, you know, information is so uh, exponential that, you know, a student coming in today, half of that stuff is going to be outdated by the second year anyway. So it's a continuous cycle. We have to remind folks. Um, just in the time we've been here, we've um, added early childhood education, nursing. We have a um, and pa we have Palmetto College started right when we got here, so we had to get funding to make sure that those students were served. Um, we have the graduate leadership distinction, so those students are really engaged, and also the research club. So even just clubs coming in, if students are now having what we call the research club, that means the advisors need to know. Okay, what are the ins and outs of how do I guide students through the research process? Um, so we have to support those students. And the person who's in a research club is more likely to be engaged in scholarship and research. And so they want, they have questions and they need to be funded for their research and um, queries as well. So these are some of the ways we build our collections, not just through what we think or what we think might be coming down the pike, but we're looking at what's going on on our campus and also what's going on in our system too. USC Lancaster is in a unique situation and a position to not only support people on our campus, but because of Palmetto College and because we're a part of a system and we're part of the Pascal system in the South Carolina, um, the, the, the South Carolina Consortium for Academic Libraries, we're really, we're really working on being an aspirant to supporting everybody in the state as much as we can while also making sure to take care of our primary um, constituents. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca. So when we're doing that collection development, um, you know, we are providing these resources to students, but also the faculty and staff. And one of the things that we really try to do is collaborate with others on campus. So we collaborate with other librarians, whether it is, you know, between the two of us. Um, we also have connections throughout library land. So we are connecting with other people. It's like, hey, do you have any recommendations for something we need to add to our collection? Um, we made a connection two years ago, I think it was, um, with a um, librarian who works in a medical library. We have a, a large nursing 
um, group. We have actually two different programs that we support for nursing. So we've made a connection with her to see what are some resources from that side of things that we're missing that we should be adding to our collection. Um, we're always picking on our faculty and staff to really get them to tell us what they need, what they need for their students. Um, I'm always telling our faculty, you know your subject way better than I do, so let me know what you need to have. What are the resources that you need? And I do that with the staff as well because, you know, you have an expertise. Tell me what I need to add because I can't, I don't know everything about chemistry or biology or anything like that. Um, we also actually work with our students, um, and this is our um, the students who work for us as well as our staff um, who are no longer students actually. Um, and we really kind of tell them, this is your library. What do you want to see in our collection? Um, and that includes, we've had them do large um, collection development projects for us where we say, I'm going to give you a specific discipline. It, you're going into nursing. What do you want to see in our collection that we're missing? Um, and it's been really helpful to get that connection. Um, and we also go and have the students, we have a, um, a form on our website where we specifically go out and ask for recommendations for our collection. Um, and then the course groups. So basically with the course groups, um, it's when we do those one-on-one -on -one instructions, um, we specifically are asking, once again, what are the materials that you need? What are the materials that you want to ask, see in the collection? And these are not just like fiction books. These are, you know, the things that they need to do their research. Um, and then campus administration, we're asking them, you know, what are the things that, you know, whether it's to support a program that's going on or it's to support faculty research, we're really working with them to ensure that we have not only the funds to do it, but also the resources to get these materials. Um, and then, of course, we're working with the community and external groups. So we do a town and gown partnership um, where we go and work with them to ensure that you know, we have the resources to provide to our students to get them where they need to go. And we've been working on collecting these award winners. Um, now, you'll notice that a lot of um, about half of these are actually children's books. One of the areas that we have been trying to grow is our juvenile collection. So we are an academic institution, but we do teach um, juvenile literature. Um, and we also know that a lot of our students have children. So we want to make this a welcoming area. So we are um, adding award winners, um, including like the Man Booker and the Pen Open. So these are things where we regularly will go through and we'll make use of our staff to really have them go through these lists and make sure that we have the books that we need to have. Um, one of the areas that I've um, tried to go through is the Global Literature and Libraries Initiative, and they've got a great resource where they have links to publishers who are publishing translations. And these are not necessarily translations that are popular, um, so popular in their home countries where they get translated to English and then are, you know, huge bestsellers here. These are translations of books that may not normally get published in English. So we're able to then go there and see what are some resources that we need to kind of add to our collection, um, you know, get translated work so they um, can represent different areas, different cultures, countries, and things like that, different perspectives that we'd like to have in our collection. And then um, we also do a lot with the NPR book reviews, um, another area that we, once a year, we have our staff go through those um, and look through and say, okay, these are the things that we want to add. We tend to go with a lot of the, the books that they go and suggest. Um, and it's a way for us to really add some of those more popular materials. Um, and then, strangely enough, we actually do go through Amazon um, when we're doing our collection development. We see and use that, hey, 
people bought this other book because of this book that you're looking at and as a way to kind of look at what are some other representations that might be really helpful to have in our collection that you're not going to necessarily see in the publishers um, that contact all libraries you're not necessarily going to see in some of those other areas um, but are really useful to get into the collection and then, of course, you know, using those popular periodicals, so like Essence, Real Simple, what are some recommendations through there that might be um, through Oprah, those kinds of things to really kind of get as many different perspectives as we can into the collection. And then, of course, the small presses, that's true with the, the Global Literature um, Initiative, um, really going with those small presses, um, especially if you, one of the areas that we've been trying to grow is our um, graphic novels. And if you have ever really bought graphic novels, you know that um, while there is a greater diversity than there used to be, you really have to look at those small presses to find the more diverse graphic novels because you're not going to find them in the larger presses. Um, so you might have to go outside what you would normally go to to, to make those purchases. And I'll let Trina talk about programs. All right. So I'm going to talk to you about programs because I believe this is kind of, um, they've been symbiotic with our collection development here at Medford Library. So I mentioned earlier um, the themed exhibits that we do. So Continental Medford was one. The first one that we ever did was called Vice and Virtue, and we just looked at the seven, the quote unquote, deadly seven sins, the set, the seven deadly sins from the Western perspective. But what these themed exhibits do is allow us to look at a topic from multiple angles. So if we go back to Continental Medford, well, we were focusing on the continents, but I was able to say we we're looking at all the peoples and cultures on each of these continents. Um, so next year we're doing um, shelf help. So we're doing help, how you can get help on different topics throughout the academic year. One month we might be doing how to prepare for your classes. One month we might be doing um, how to check in and do um, take care of your physical body. So it allows us to um, offer different aspects of a topic, but it, what it also does is when I decide on the topic, I, rec I start looking for books to see what we have and what we don't have, and so therefore we're now identifying these gaps in our collections. So these themed active exhibits really help us um, um, figure out what the gaps are. So we do um, signage with sh short factoids about the major topics, including more information. The goal is to alert the visitors about things that they may not know we have or point of views that they may not have considered. And also the goal is to encourage um, civil discourse. So we're focused on, you know, these are the facts and then can you, can you subjugate your, what you feel about certain facts to have a conversation about a variety of perspectives. We also have passive themed exhibits. So we have our active ones that we, we, we present and we, we promote those on campus and in our visual information system on campus. But then the passive themed exhibits are things that we just decide we're gonna put out um, for that month. So whatever the month, we'll, we'll find out that, you know, you know, January celebrates a lots of different things and we'll pick a, whatever one of those topics and then we'll put out books about that topic. So our passive exhibit for June is uh, Pride, Pride Month. So while we might not be putting out um, things on the campus visual information system, it gives us an opportunity to have a secondary exhibit. And those are um, quite um, popular, actually. We have minimum signage and the, the um, passive event uh, the passive exhibit is placed right at the large um, library's entrance desk and people browse those books often and pick them up and it's because it's high visibility and good interest. I remember one year, I can't remember what we were doing, but it must have been focused on women and a per and there's a book on Shirley Chisholm and I'll never forget, I'm so glad I was able to see it, the person picked up the book and they were like, oh! and they picked it up and they checked it out right away. And so that's the um, power of the passive themed exhibit that people may not know that we even had, she, that, that person probably never knew, really realized we had that book, but because we were doing that passive exhibit and it was right there, she picked it up right away and checked it out right away. 
We also have programs um, that highlight associated resources. So we have maker spaces that um, we have a big, what we call a creative venture at least once a semester. And whenever we do it, we put out books that are associated with it. One of our most popular ones, a great um, example of that is one year we did Super Spring and students came to do magnets, create magnets. But what they were doing while they were creating the magnets was they were talking about graphic novels during that conversation. So even though they were making things, they were talking about reading. And so their students are more likely to browse and check out items right after a program event. And they tend to discuss issues and ideas during the events, which leads them to see if we have books about them and then they check them out. And these are just some photos of our programs as collections. On the first slide, the students with the skulls, um, we've done Dia de los Muertos for um, twice, and that was from the latest one we did last last academic year. Um, and so we put out books about um, Hispanic culture, Mexican culture, since that's particularly a Mexican um, event that happens in Mexican culture. Um, and so students came to um, design their own skulls, and then they had churros and hot chocolate, and they could read about bo um, books on Mexican culture. Um, the second one is the event that I just mentioned, the, what students were making, um, the uh, magnets. Um, and talking about the books, and you can see there's a variety of folks coming to this event. And the person in our, um, the person in the red vest is our dean, so uh, the the campus dean. So literally everyone comes to these events. And then um, on the last one we had, um, this is a um, idea about the importance of decentering dominant voices. So the last um, picture group, the last collage with the students and everybody holding the nachos, that's um, a screening of the film Dope. And so students picked that, picked that. Um, that movie and then they came and they enjoyed nachos and as you can see again a variety of folks coming in. In particular the last slide talks about how we normalize diversity so that's our goal is to normalize diversity and so a couple of things you can do to normalize diversity one is don't announce it just do it there's no need to announce that you have a diverse collection just make your collection diverse there's no need to announce that you have a diverse constituent um, body. Just respond to them. Um, and put out the books and the resources. Put them out there. It's just put out what you have, and if you find you don't have anything, get the things that you need. Um, please do not discount the power of seeing oneself. As a person of color living in the South all of my life, um, seeing yourself is, 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 a, is a be, mean that you, you exist. When you don't see yourself, when people don't see themselves, you are telling them that they do not exist. And that includes their visible and invisible, their visible and invisible um, diversities. So do not discount the power of people seeing themselves in your collection. Do not wait for special or designated days, weeks, months, holidays, or what have you to showcase diversity. Don't wait for Black History Month to show off the books that you have about the Black people or what have you, or um, Asian American History Month um, to yeah. show off the books that you have about people of Asian descent. Um, but during those times, do heighten those presentations. Um, work to decentralize dominant discourses, protagonists, and the like. So one of the things on that last um, slide about the students coming to watch the film Dope, we gave students the opportunity to choose between four films, and none of those films offered um, a dominant protagonist. And so they picked the film, um, they picked from those films. Um, and this is just so people know that other groups have a kaleidoscopic um, worldview, they have kaleidoscopic experiences, and you can pick from those things and still learn about or experience an intriguing story or an intriguing viewpoint, an exciting viewpoint. Um, maybe it's something that you expect and maybe it might be different, but there's a collide. Um, these groups are, groups are not monolithic in their experiences. So decentralize those um, dominant discourses and protagonists. And also accept that things take time to circulate. So um, just because the books aren't moving now doesn't mean they won't move in a couple of weeks, or maybe it'll take longer than that. But um, taking things out of circulation or off because they're not circulating like, quote unquote, the other books are, it, I think is um, doing um, your users a disservice and it causes them not to trust you. 
other ways we normalize diversity, um, this is how we normalize it on our website. So we want people to know that we have books by folks. And while we do have um, these same headers for people uh, who are not of um, color, we make sure that we make that we, um, this is a way we can make sure that we're showing off. Yes, we have these books too by these authors. We have a lot of their books. We have all of their books. Read them too. Click here and see all the books that we have by these authors. We also normalize diversity on our website, on our social media. So these are some pictures from our um, IG feed. And you'll see we offer, this is how, this is the newest set of um, AV, for instance. This is a book that we're reading, um, a cool book that just came in. Um, we have things that are in other languages. And um, that students also, this is a picture, that last picture of the students, those are students who work, who we work with in a class and for children's literature class and they um, had to, um, what they did was they were tasked with uh, locating award-winning books for children's literature um, for children with disabilities. Um, it was any kind of, any kind of, uh, it was just diversity. So disability, ability, um, race, whatever um, they wanted to work on, they were looking for books and um, they had to work on diversifying our collection. So that's what they did. One thing I want to point to you on, on that second feat, on that second one, the book Pachinko, this is a very small detail and I didn't realize um, that I'd done it till afterward, but you'll see that my hand is on that book. And that might not mean anything to a lot of people, but for people of color, that means a great deal um, because what it does is it says, I can read this book too, because often reading is a, is a white centered activity. And um, you only often, even if you look up, if you can go to Google images right now, or we can talk about the algorithms of oppression, but if you go to Google, Google images right now, you'd be hard pressed to really find a book, a picture of, of you know, as many pictures of African-Americans or people of color reading. So small things that situate people of color reading, even small hand, small things like a brown hand on a book makes sure it makes people feel like, oh, that's me. I, I am seen. So whenever we talk about collection development, we always have to go back on the on the flip side and that is pushback. Um but but you know diversity is a basic need for collection development. We have to balance the current community with our aspirant community needs. So we have a current community and then you have um, the folks who may show up later or even what you would like, what, who do you want in the space too. Also, also, not instead of, but also, who also would you like coming into this space? Also, remind folks that collection development is grounded in the LIS Code of Ethics, which goes back to what we mentioned at the beginning. Um, we have an um, obligation, a professional obligation to be aspirant in our collection development work. If you haven't yet, consider updating your organizational mission and vision statements to include equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. You might not want to do this. In, please don't do this in a vacuum. Um, work with lots of constituents. Get help from ALA. Contact um, the task force and other folks whom you feel might be helpful in that. The strategic plan should include benchmarks and assessment channels for your goals where, where um, collection development is concerned. And don't forget to standardize procedures for challenges to resources. So at our library, we have a collection development policy, but until 2014 or so, um, the collection development policy did not include what happens if someone challenges a resource oh. in our library? So now we've had that standardized. Um, and that helps us with weeding. Um, and also as a library, as an academic library, we often get pushback whenever we have to do weeding because the idea, this is one of those stereotypes of librarians that um, we love to do, you know, we want to get rid of all the books. Well, we don't want to get rid of all the books, but we're a two-year institution with uh, with uh, lots of programs that change rapidly. And so we're not an archive. So libraries are not archives. Archives are archives. And our library at this time is not an archive. So we that's how we kind of meet. So be prepared to meet um, weeding challenges and how are you going to manage um, what the pushback is from your faculty and staff and even your community. And also for us, any pushback that we receive really for us is an indication to increase exposure. 
to that wide range of topics, voices, images, and experiences. Some people might call that subversive, but I believe it's just a natural response because if a person challenges something, it probably means that they need to know more about it so they can understand it better. So that's one of the ways we work on pushback. And we encourage our employees to engage in intellectual freedom conversations. Just a few days ago, just a few weeks ago, um, we heard our students talking about an image that was in a book and we were asking, you know, tell us about their thoughts about it. And, you know, we had a nice, a good conversation. I thought it was a useful conversation for, you know, you can put the book back on the shelf. Somebody else might need to see that image. Um, so there's lots of information needs out there that don't necessarily, um, may not, intersect with what you want to see and you can put the book back on the shelf and this other person can still have access to the information that they need. So it was an interesting conversation um, and it was nice to have that conversation with students because we don't often get to have that conversation and tell students what really what librarianship is about and that is making sure people have access to information regardless of our personal beliefs, which to me is not the same as neutrality. Um, that's all we have right now for um, for our formal presentation. We'll take questions. I think we have about five more minutes. And um, Katrina, did you see a question by Angie about the is the um, active and si active and passive distinction in the amount of signage? That was from um, a few slides yeah. ago. So the active, the active means that we are deliberately like it's the, not only the amount of signage, but the kind of signage. So for the active um, things, we, we plan those out a year ahead of time. Like next year, I already know what that looks like. Um, I know the questions that I want to ask as points of discussion. Um, and I know that um, some of our programs may or may not um, reflect what our formal pro, um what our formal exhibits are. Um, the passive one is we're not sure what we're doing until we do it. Um, we're not, if people want to ask questions, they can, but the books are just out there, if that makes sense. So we might not decide, like we just didn't decide to do the pride one until like literally like two weeks ago. Whereas I know what we're doing for next year, for next year, every academic, every, every month of the academic year, I know what that monthly exhibit looks like and I know what questions or facts I'm putting out as points of discussion and um, go from there. Is that answer? I hope that answers your question. So not only the amount of signage but the kind of signage. One is done to specifically engage people and the other one is like hey it's this month if you want to read something about it. Oh uh, hi. Can you hear hi. me? Yes. Oh, hi, this is Sloan Clark, Allen University. How are you? Hey, Sloan, how are you? Okay, um, I like your presentation. Um, I have two questions. The first question is about programming. Um, I've been doing programming for a long time, and I was wondering, uh, do you all have any type of, um, you know, how do you come up with a programming idea? like? Like right now, I'm a liaison with humanities, and I try to do program based on humanities um, that all students would be interested in. Um, do you all get any type of funding for your programming, or do you have to do everything out of pocket? Okay, so I'm gonna repeat the question because I'm on um, my headphones and Rebecca can't hear it. So the question she has is, how do we come up with our programming and do we get funding for our programming? So um, the answer to the first question is, um, I think Rebecca would just say that she runs away from me a lot because I always have ideas. I literally like, I'm coming to her like, I got an idea. I got an idea, what do you think about so-and-so? So those types of things for me are kind of um, just a part of, I'm always thinking about things um, and I have ideas up to three years in advance. Like I already know what we're doing up to two years in advance. They might change if something else comes up, but I have things in the pocket. Um, because we are in terms of your, we don't, and since it's just us librarians and we don't have, us just, just us two librarians and we don't have a liaison model where, you know, we're dedicated to one or a couple of disciplines or maybe five disciplines, some people. Um, mm -hmm. 
we're here to serve everyone. So one of the great things about when I am thinking of ideas, I'm thinking of things that are broad that speak to a variety of things. So like in a couple of years, we're gonna be doing secrets from our shelves, but that's just you know things like cultural histories of or secret histories of. Well, that covers a lot. That covers food science, that covers you know computer science, that covers um, health, the you know secrets of the brain or whatever. So really, you know, it offers us an opportunity. What I'm trying to figure out when I am thinking of these ideas is, is it kaleidoscopic in nature? Can I offer um, different aspects of a topic? So all of our students who are working generally in the lower divisions and some of them in the upper divisions have a place from which they can start or have an interest in it. They can see that th these are multifaceted conversations. The second thing are perspectives. The second question is when we first came, we had absolutely no money for budgets, none. And I made I made them stop that. And so now we have a dedicated budget. So now every year I write a budget out and I say, this is what we need to do these programs. But I think that's because the first program I did when they realized people came to the library, um, I just started saying, if you give more programs, then people will come to the library and use the space. So I really made it about being, so, so for me, it was really the programs need to happen so people know they're welcome in the space. Once they know they're welcome in the space, you got to have them, you got to, they got to see themselves in the shell. They have to see themselves in the mm -hmm. shell. So that's what I'm saying for us, you know, I'm not, in my mind, I was like, people are probably going to think, why are they talking about programs? But it's really symbiotic and it doesn't have to be, we don't have any money for book authors. We're never going to ask people who have come and done book authors or author signings or stuff, but they're like in the community. We're never going to get Carlson Whitehead um, um, to come down here because it's not the interest, but that doesn't mean that we can't show off his books and have programs that make his books relevant. Mm -hmm. So we have to figure okay. out ways for people to, to know that these things exist and they don't need to know that we, whether or not we have money for it or not, but we can do it through our programs. And so it's really for us, the programs have really been the driver for making sure that we're closing these gaps in mm -hmm. our collection. And another thing I want to say is um, Rebecca and I work feverishly on collection development and even at our fee and I'll say feverishly and we are mm -hmm. only going to add about a thousand titles every year. So it's slow going for us, but that doesn't mean mm -hmm. we don't do it, all right? It's slow going, we're only gonna add up, if I, we have to do other things, but we're feverishly working on our collection development. And I think last, on average, we're probably gonna add about a thousand books to our collection on. Well, on how average. much is that? How much will be, how many students you have at Lancaster? At the last headcount checkpoint, um, I noticed, and that was in the spring, so our numbers coming up haven't, um, been static yet or they haven't been you know did that static cut thing but the last time I looked for a static number when it was the cutoff it was about 1300 but we're on track from what I understand to increase a little bit in the coming uh, academic year hmm, okay okay well I have more questions but I, we don't have enough time <laughs> right I'll email you okay <laughs> thank you Sloan are there any other You're questions welcome. All right, well, it does take time to form questions. And so if you have questions for any of us, we're easily findable on the interwebs. Um, we also have some reading. So when we did some searching, we really found it's very difficult to find information on collection assessment and what li libraries are doing. But that's something for you. And um, the, the young that you see is Courtney Young, as in past ALA president. And here are some works cited as well. We want to thank South Carolina Library Association for inviting USC um, Lancaster's Metford Library librarians. Me and Rebecca are really happy to be able to talk with you today. We hope that it's been helpful. Um, we're unique yeah. and, um, thank and um, you. <laughs> we realize that our practices may be um, non-conventional or odd, but we're a small library and it's just us too. So we've really been working on what works best for us considering our very limited staff and faculty. Um, employment pool here at the Medford Library. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Katrina and Rebecca, for um, presenting today. And I'm going to change it back to my screen real quick to um, share a little bit of information bef before we go. Um, so hopefully everyone can see this. Um, uh, thank you for attending. Our next webinar from SCLA will be on Thursday, June 27th at 2 p.m. and it is titled Clemson University Latino Voices Past, Present, Future and it will be presented by Derek Wilmot.
from Clemson University. And you can also see the link there if you would like to submit your own webinar proposal. And we will be sending out the recording and the slides from today as well to anyone who is registered. Thanks again for attending.